Well, I, when I was little, um, I was raised by a mother and father who liked to be outdoors and who also had a sense of family history. And so um, early on, I was concerned with things historical. Uh, I also grew up on a place where we had lots of artifacts lying about. Um, family artifacts, heirlooms, pieces of junk, um, uh, an old outdoor privy. So I think by the time I was in grade school, I had a fascination with really what's archaeology. Um, I didn't always know it, but I was always keeping things and having my own little curio cabinet full of relics. Um, at some point, outside, my, it turns out that my grandparents used to own a farm that they had picked up uh, Native American artifacts, and they had left some lie outside a barn, and I discovered one of these, which just radically altered my whole universe at that point. I, I, you know, I was amazed by this thing. Um, and so from that point on, kind of mixing paleontology and archaeology, so the study of, you know, the fossil remains of, of animals and the study of, of kind of, you know, past people, I always think I had my sights set on some kind of study of the past, um, such that when I got to um, high school and met some other people with similar interests, we kind of formed little, cl little clubs or little associations. Um, by college, I was decided I was going into, um, again, some mix of geology or, or, or anthropology. Um, and uh, it just snowballed from there, um, especially when I happened to land a position working for an archaeologist at the St. Louis District Corps of Engineers in college as an intern. And that internship lasted three years. And that internship really is what allowed me to think professionally about I could do this as a profession. I could, I could survive. I could make it a career. Um, I met a lot of the archaeologists doing a lot of the work uh, around that was St. Louis. Um, and I started to just develop my thoughts about what, why we would do such a thing, why such a thing was important, which took me then to grad school, of course. Um, grad school initially was at Southern Illinois University and then uh, transferred to the University of Michigan, uh, primarily because I had, and, had come to know some of the um, established uh, senior people in the field, one person in particular, uh, a guy named Jimmy Griffin. And I wanted to be like Jimmy Griffin. So off to grad school in Michigan, um, where I started broadening my horizons anthropologically. I, sh I was about to shift into working uh, in Africa for a while. Um, I certainly considered Mesoamerica. Uh, the opportunities just didn't uh, manifest themselves at the right times and so I ended up sticking with what was familiar for me which was the Mississippi Valley um, and uh, really pursued a you know, <coughs> research project on this thousand-year-old civilization um, the centerpiece of which is the just huge site of Cahokia um, and really have spent you know most of my career um, following up on um, the, the problems uh, especially, you know, increasingly, uh, the problems as they address the bigger issues for the contemporary world or for the, cont the contemporary world as we, you know, need to understand the past, if, if that makes sense. Um, and, and here I am. Um, you started with uh, family history work and with artifacts that were connected to people you knew. Uh, did that origin shape how things, how your approach, or was it just kind of the, the first impulse to do history at all? I think it shaped my approach in the long term. Um, had you asked me that question, you know, just 10, 20 years ago, I would not have answered it the way I'm about to. And you know, now what I, what I do is I see you know, objects and remains as still very active in, a, in the contemporary world so that recovering these is not just about explaining the past, but it's about living in the present you know, with the past. 
um, such that there's a more intimate connection that is made through things or spaces or narratives or what have you. And I, and I really value that kind of intimate connection and uh, am really theorizing that more. How that connection or the moment of, of, of the, those connecting moments matter um, in terms of you know, larger scale, longer term histories. Right? So it's a, what I do I think is, is object heavy, um, very f uh, an approach that sees culture and thoughts and beliefs, things that lots of people think are sort of ethereal and like hard to pin down. Um, I see those instead as very much um, present and physical and experiential. So, so yes, I mean, I think that all stems from this early fascination with things and the connection to family. Yeah. I, as I'm understanding you, you're saying something like you're interested in the way in which somebody right now walking into a, a room and seeing an object from the past is connected through that object to the past. Is that part of it? Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Um, you know, this is why uh, uh, television shows, you know, uh, Antiques Roadshow is so popular. And, and I watch that as well. Um, because you learn, there's so much uh, in that thing. Uh, narratives, you know, are all connected through these um, things, these sort of bottlenecks of storytelling. And that, that's also the moment when you can invent or reinvent. That's the moment you know, when you're connecting to these things that you can, you or other people can uh, uh, project power or you know, uh, you know, create a, a, a relationship that is power laden you know, through a thing, you know, a pretty thing, a, an object of status or what have you, um, through, its, through the moment and then the history you know, that's uh, um, uh, built into that thing. I remember in my own past it was object laden, at least at my grandmother's house. And I remember my encounter with all the horse gear. I mean, we weren't horsey people. We didn't do horses recreationally, but horses have gone from being the totality of my father's life to <laughs> nothing. And there was still all this re horse residue. I mean, harnesses and saddles and just all this equipment that was like a window into a world like, you know, I, at the time I didn't realize that if there was that much equipment, this had to be huge. Yeah. This, and this had to be the thing that people were thinking about most of the time. And I guess it's gotten more important to me now. My dad's dead, and now I'm, I'm remembering, trying to kind of understand the world he came from. And it, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of the, that for me, that, that's now that's going back what less than a hundred years, but it's it's the sense of the connection to a totally lost time. I, I like the way you put that. Um, that it's just a hundred years, and you refer to it as totally lost, because I think we do people in the present tend to oversimplify their their heritage and their connections to a past, as if. You're the direct lineal descendant, you know, of some past people, and you do what they did. You are culturally like them, which is true to some extent, but it's true through assemblages of things, such that if there is a dramatically different assemblage of things in your family's past, that past is probably radically different from the present that you're living. And so, uh, you know, the, it's a way of of appreciating how much change we really um, are experiencing now. I mean, with all the dramatic technological shifts every week, practically, or certainly you know every year, that we are rapidly changing. Um, if we and we can understand it if we think about not just one thing, as I was referring to before, but groups, assemblages, uh, webs of relationships that are tethered to whole fields of of uh, 
you know, things and spaces and places and, and, and how much we, you know, change and shift those connections and alter those webs as we move forward. Sometimes we pull more of the past in, some people will. Other people will pull less of the past in through things. And, and so, um, you know, it, it, even in the present, I think we can find that we can be in a room full of people who, who are experiencing their pasts and who are living in webs of relationships really differently from the way that the next person in the, in the room might be living. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I think we can understand how this works and therefore we can understand pasts with some degree of some level of confidence. But how do we do that? It's kind of through archaeology. I mean, I don't think you can narrate this. You can't write it down. That's an imperfect description of some past. You have to understand it materially because that's how it's being created over and over. So, so when, I, when I talk to some historian friends, I'll tell them basically you need to be archaeologists. You need to understand the past in this way. Um, you can't just read about it, even if you have wonderful texts, you know, by our accounts, first-hand accounts of something from the past. It has to be, you have to allow archaeology to come into your lives. I, I kind of try to missionize my other historian friends and <laughs> make them converts to archaeology. I'm just conscious as you're speaking that the house where I encountered all the wonderful objects from, you know, in, as a kid, has been buried. And the house I grew up in has been buried. Uh, and if, if the context tacked back to the object is, is central, there's a, you know, there, there's a break for me that there wasn't for my dad. <laughs> it's, and it's, uh, and of course, a break for Americans that there wouldn't have been for European families who could, you know, take their take their house back to 1600 sometimes. Yeah. Now, uh, now, of course, for you or for other people who've experienced those kinds of uh, abrupt transitions, there there is still a power in knowing that there is a void. And. And, and that, like, there are archaeologists who study such things, so the, the material, like things that we know about but are somehow removed from the experiential, or at least uh, are only accessible through some experiences and not through others. Um, so I, I, it will cease to be a powerful experience in the future, but for you right now, that's, that's powerful. Um, and maybe even more powerful because you can't see it. It's, it's sort of here. So for a while, you control some kind of knowledge or power, you know, some connection that you can, that you have that other people don't have. Um, the, the people I, uh, the, the ancient folks that I studied did similar things. And in fact, this is what archaeology does, right? We're trying, to re we're trying to fill those voids. Like, we know there's something in the past that's powerful. All right, so we go out, we set about trying to, to recover a material to fill in that void. Um, people I study, uh, the Mississippians, did the same thing, interestingly enough. At the very beginning of this uh, sort of dramatic uptick in activity and the construction of a city, they clearly had priestly, uh, let's call them archaeologists, they were people who went back in and excavated older places where they knew something happened, and they went back and, like, and reanimated and recovered remains. Uh, because I think that because it is such a powerful void that needs filling. So you have at least some of your focus on the, re the various kinds of relationships or that people have to their pasts. That's an important part of what you think about. Mm -hmm. And you can watch the relationships that the Mississippian people had to their past, and you can think about our relationship to them, and uh, a whole range of relationships that different people might have to these artifacts. 
Yeah, and I thought at, at this moment in time, what really uh, um, interests me are things that would we would call it religion. So what is it about a religious relationship that makes it religious? And I don't tend to, and so this is something I've been researching uh, primarily in the, in the uh, Mississippi Valley. Um, and I don't tend to want to identify religion as some set of institutions or some special places or something that's sacred as opposed to profane. You know, I, I see it as a, as a more continuous fluid field of, of relationships. And yet there is something that all people will identify as powerful and sort of the sacred powers. Um, so I want to understand that. What makes those contexts or those moments or those experiences you know, powerful in a religious way. Um, and a lot of my, uh, the, the ongoing field work we're doing is actually intended to recover those contexts and, and see um, how they were constructed. Uh, Can you say a bit more about recovering the context? Yeah, maybe recovering isn't even a very good word. Uh, because obviously you never can recover the past. Um, you can reconnect to it in some ways, uh, to some aspects of it. And for an archaeologist, that means, say, you, you say you're excavating um, some, some domestic setting, some zone where you think there's a building. Um, uh, Oftentimes, when we've been doing this, you come down on a, because we we're excavating pole and thatch buildings, and the poles are rotted away, the thatch is gone. Sometimes you know, the buildings have burned down, you can see the debris of the construction materials. But if not, all you're left with is some, a stain in the ground with artifacts in association with the stain. Uh, as we excavate down through the fill on top of a floor, you can sometimes isolate moments. Either it's like refuse disposal moments, or there's an offering, perhaps. Or you can see a rain event, and so and what was happening you know, during that rain event, what got washed in. Finally, you make it to the floor, and you expose a floor that hasn't been seen or walked on for, let's say, a thousand years. And there is this sense at that moment of reconnecting uh, one human being to another or to some family that leads me to use the word recover, to recover a context. Like that floor, the history of what happened in that house, we are somehow engaging again. Um, and so that is kind of what we're looking for. You know, those special contexts, um, a floor, an offering, a, a post that aligns to an astronomical event, um, a sequence of fills that show that multiple groups or clans might have contributed their labor in one event to construct a, a mound, let's say. Um, and even like the microscopic uh, or microscale um, context, like somebody sitting down and cooking a meal and breaking a pot or somebody making a tool. Uh, that's what archaeology always recovers, and that is what we look for. Um, if you can control those contexts well enough, aerially and temporally, you can start to tell really interesting narratives. Uh, they weren't the narratives of people of the past, but you are still connecting to that past in a way that you can tell your own narrative that will kind of parallel, perhaps, other narratives. I hope that's not too much methodological. No, I just do um, How often, as you're working in a site like this, do you make discoveries or have moments of insight? Uh, I ask because I, I visited an archaeological site uh, a few months ago and was just, you know, impressed by the amount of soil <laughs> and, you know, the, the Museum of Prize Artifacts that 
weren't entirely prized to the outside. <laughs> I, I, you know, that I thought the drudgery of this must be incredible, but maybe I'm wrong. So how is it as you're excavating? Uh, are at a certain level, do you start, do you see things all the time? Do you have this kind of constant imaginative engagement or is there, is it like dig for a week and then suddenly, <laughs> oh, this is interesting. <laughs> Digged for a month and so then suddenly something is, puzzles you or how does it go? It, de it depends a lot on the kind of excavation we're talking about. Okay. So small scale excavations into sort of unknown deposits of midden, let's say, where it's like you're not quite sure what you're excavating into, how it relates to other things around it. Sometimes these are called telephone booth style excavations. Those can be, I mean, probably not many moments like the, of the sort I just described. Because um, even if you find some layer that, oh, that could be important, you, you're not sure how to make sense of it because you don't have any you know, anything else beyond it to relate it to. Um, other kinds of excavations, however, and these are typically more uh, aerially extensive, where it's say you have opened up a part of a site and you know you have 10 house locations. And, and there's students or crew members working in each one of these houses and you can start to see patterns between them or not, um, alignments between them or something that's odd, you know, there, but it's not over there. You, especially if, if this is an excavation that follows up other excavations, and so you have a sense of, a better sense of patterns, you can have these moments daily. Um, and they're not always, they're not generally, they're very seldom dramatic, you know, a golden idol. You know, no, it, it's, it's a particular, oh look, there's a red slip pacho here, in the same kind of water deposit as we have in these three other places. And I wonder if there's a, 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 a moment here where all these buildings were exposed to the rain at one time and voila, you've got some bigger narrative of what's happening at that site. Uh, last summer, I'm thinking especially in this very instance of an excavation we did last summer. So here's some, here's some of the moments. We, we knew something of the site, it's called the Emerald Site. It's a really interesting, odd place. It's on the edge of the, the, sort of the Cahokia territory. In an odd situation in, a, in the prairie of Illinois where there's not much else. So it's odd to begin with, and you think, why are they out here? We had done some archaeoastronomy and realized there, the mounds are aligned to an obscure lunar um, moonrise, uh, moonrise event. Um, isn't that interesting? Maybe we should excavate along the, the axis that, of where this, we think this alignment is and see what we find. So instantly we opened up one area and found big public structures, big uh, you know, um, council houses and meeting halls and temples where actually I didn't expect it. And so that was the first like, oh my, oh my. <laughs> This is, these public buildings are on this unusual alignment at this unusual site. That was, maybe that's important. We kept excavating, we found that indeed there was uh, some correspondence between the construction and abandonment of the various buildings in this section of the site. So they looked, they've been put up at once and taken down more or less at once. We figured that, that out through seeing these correspondences between features or between the buildings, similar deposits, suggesting that they were all, you know, uh, dismantled and, and abandoned at the same, on the same day, basically. Um, we also then, uh, as part of that co correspondences, realized we had a human offering in one of these pits, and she was also had been exposed to this particular rain event that we found in the other dismantled buildings. And that another great aha, sort of, they're, they're, this is a, a special ritual moment. They are leaving behind a human offering as they dismantle all these things and expose them to a, the rain, the sky, the powers of the sky. Um, so those are, those are three or four there. Uh, there, there are more, um, and this is just one excavation where we had other, like, oh, we have pilgrim housing. 
oh, that's what it looks like. You know, we, uh, yeah, so frequent. But this was a large scale excavation. We had 30 people in the field. And so uh, Susan Alt, the co-director and myself, could kind of wander around and look and say, oh, there's one. <laughs> that's important. So all the students wouldn't necessarily know it, but we would then you know, make a moment out of it. Um, uh, yeah. So what's the division of labor in terms of putting the story together? Uh, the person who ends up telling a definitive story, is that generally the archaeologist who's worrying about when things got exposed to rain, or is there this thing that happens where the archaeologist has ahas at the level of this got exposed to rain, and somebody else who's drawing on all sorts of other things has the, well, this is what was going on in the site, and this is how these pilgrimage sites were used, etc. Uh, how, how, how does that work? Uh, I think the, the directors of a project, especially if it's a big field project, do have the, the opportunities to have more of those moments. Oh. But realistically, archaeology is a team sport. So we rely on grad students who are doing dissertations, you know, on some aspect of, of the larger project. Uh, we rely on undergrads who are doing you know, either internships or they're doing you know, honors papers. And, and they, do, they do put some of the pieces together too and realize things that you, you just you can't realize in the field. Because it takes some reflection um, and some consideration of other data sets, you know, other, other information or interpretations out there. Uh, so it's shared, I think it is, is, it's true. But um, some people just aren't in a position to quite understand it all. Uh, you know, I, so we, we routinely have geomorphologists, uh, occasionally a geologist. We occasionally have uh, Native American friends kind of working with us. And let's say a couple of years ago, we were in uh, Wisconsin working on, um, oh, at the site of Trempolo, Wisconsin, working on a Cahokian outpost, really interesting place. And we had um, uh, uh, Native American collaborators um, uh, working with this, or at least sort of at the interpretive level, like, what do you think of this? And occasionally opinions that they express based on, you know, um, what they learned when they were younger, I hadn't thought of. You know, and I, oh, of course, maybe that's what that means. Uh, and they also had the same kind of reaction to some of the, our archaeological findings. They would look and say, oh, that makes sense relative to what I had thought, you know, uh, what I had known from the past. And I think that there was, it was a really interesting two-way collaboration there in that case because they got something out of the archaeology, these were a couple of elders, and we got something out of hearing them, you know, um, talk about their reactions to what we were doing. Uh, so yeah, collaborative, um, uh, multidisciplinary and, you know, and, and not even multidisciplinary. It's, it's, there's multiple voices increasingly that we all know we need to bring to bear on these bigger stories. What kind of person writes the sort of book that you know, has titles like The Structures of Everyday Life or <laughs> The Culture of the Cahokia or uh, Religious Life? <laughs> now, the Structures of Everyday Life is not my book. You're thinking of Fredell. Right? Oh, yeah, but I, mean, that, I mean, just that level of kind of putting it all together. I mean, do, do archaeologists write that kind of thing or... Is there a kind of, again, I'm just curious about the division of labor and the kind of hierarchy of, of levels of understanding. Uh, you know, as I get older, I, 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 can, I appreciate the, this question and, and I can answer it. I don't think I could have be younger. And I think archaeology is a pretty large discipline. Um, and there are people working in compliance uh, in the compliance world, like you know, making sure laws are upheld and making sure these uh, an area gets surveyed and we look for sites. Um, there are then the all the way up to like academics in ivory towers, you know, trying to to uh, address the larger you know, relevance of archaeology to the world today. I think ninety five percent of archaeology 
doesn't approach or, or consist of people who aren't able to or don't want to or uh, haven't ever considered about writing a book like the kind you mentioned, the structures of everyday life. Because <laughs> there's a lot of work, and some of it is drudgerous. Um, and it goes into mundane kinds of inference construction. Like, how do we know when you know, this site was here in the 11th century? Well, it involves recovering carbon, dating the carbon, connecting it to pottery, and making sure that you, know, you, you have some other independent way of confirming the date. And then, and then you get to the level of what were they doing here? So uh, all these mundane, drudgerous tasks, which you know, can be satisfying, um, I think archaeologists do them because they are fulfilling. Uh, you can know that fact. Um, uh, yeah, never reach the level of the big narrative. And the big narratives uh, certainly interest me. Um, and I think, it, however, it takes a point. You have to wait until you, you know, get to a point where you have absorbed enough comparative and historical information that you have these big opinions. And, you know, and I say opinions because a lot of these big narratives are surely wrong. But they will at least drive that other 95% of archaeology that gets done. Like, what should I look for? Well, what does the big narrative say? And then they go look for you know, something that might fit into the, the larger story. Um, and then invariably it will prove that that larger narrative is not quite right. <laughs> so uh, I guess to answer your question, I guess it takes a bit of chutzpah, a bit of uh, being a senior to, uh, to write a book like that. And it, and, but even then, it relies on a lot of people doing all of the hard work. Right? Well, just in terms of your thinking about your own career and your own development, do you see a book like that as the thing you're growing towards? <laughs> or are you perfectly happy just to stay with these inferences at lower levels? Uh, no, it, it is, uh, in fact, the last book I did is, is reaching the, uh, the, the kind of book that you're talking about. It is talking about religion and why are people religious, period. Uh, and it does a really high level, you know, it's the story of humanity, like what makes us human? What is it about? Um, how we connect and relate to things that makes us human and makes us spiritual beings, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and I see the future is filled with more books like that. I mean, that, because, I mean, my goal, and it, it, my goal is to, to understand the big picture. Like, you know, the, I wanted to, I want to explain why are we the way we are? Why do we believe things? Why are we susceptible to, other people who sell us things, uh, ideas or, or actual objects. Those, things, th those kind of questions really interest me. Now, having said that, however, you can never leave, the, as, a, as an archaeologist or perhaps as a human being, you can never leave the quotidian, uh, the, the experiential behind, um, because that's where the answers to the big questions are. It's, it's like, it's like the, the bigger problem of, of globalization, right? I mean, the, a lot of the people thinking about globalization come back to realize the, the global is in the local. I mean, it's, we, we live it. And so it means that it's down here at the same time that it's, it's something that's around the world. And I, the, the big narratives work that way, too. Um, I, so I'm interested for, uh, in understanding pan-American relationships. Well, how is it that we have Mesoamerican looking material and imagery in the Mississippi Valley or vice versa? Um, but to understand that, you have to understand the history of both places in intimate details. Like, how are people living those connections? I mean, how are they bringing references you know, to, say, Mesoamerica into their lives? Uh, and that's I'm not sure if I'm explaining this very well, but it, it has to be simultaneously both. And I think archaeologists who leave the local or leave the realm of the ordinary counting sherds behind end up having stories that aren't very, very useful. I did some work this summer. Uh, 
very far from anything you care about. But um, just interviewing people who address food issues in rural Minnesota, uh, organic farmers and people who are doing new restaurants and so forth. And I was overwhelmed by the variety and the creativity that was you could find in about 40 40 mile circle but also I was struck by you know all of the hints from this discussion about how ideas travel <laughs> about how things one wouldn't expect to find in rural Minnesota were very yeah. were central I mean, uh, and we're interacting with uh, various projects in, in strange ways. I'm wondering, do you think that it's important for an archaeologist to have one foot in living communities? In, I mean, if you're going to try to understand how ideas from way south came north, is it, is it important to understand how ideas from Japan <laughs> end up in Wyndham, Minnesota, and why it is that somebody from Wyndham, Minnesota is very excited and empowered by taking something from Japan. <laughs> I, I'm just curious about that, that mixture of very contemporary understandings and archaeology. Do you, do you find those bridges kind of occurring to you as you work? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I routinely bring such kinds of things, analogies of this sort, into the classroom, too. And I, and I think what's going on, and perhaps it always goes on, but see, this is, uh, the, the, what I see now is, um, there, we are leaving behind old-fashioned models of, like, the origins of state, or, you know, the, the, the rise of leaders, you know, or, or even the origins of agriculture, as if they're, there's something that happened long ago. And so therefore, there's no contemporary referent. We're leaving those kinds of things behind as we're moving to a whole series of new questions which are rooted in the present, but are they reinforming um, our archaeology? And you do have to be constantly theorizing in the present by looking around the world, especially with regard to the kinds of things you just asked about, like ideas, you know, exotic ideas, uh, you know, being, you know, moving around. Uh, yeah, all, all the old models, they don't even, they don't even deal, they don't deal with any of that, except to attribute, to set us, to know that it happened. They can't, they can't explain any of it, because they, they just, they were never uh, sophisticated and rich enough. And that richness we need to get out of the, out of our contemporary observations. Um, yeah, I, I, I see, a, uh, it's been happening for 10, 20 years, but a, a radical retooling and reconceptualizing of what archaeology is, and I think it's increasingly uh, not just rooted in a discipline of anthropology where it has a set of you know, procedures, methods, and theories. It's opening up as we become you know, mixed up with other kinds of of disciplines and, um, and interests. And food, oh yeah, food. So for instance, here's, a, here's an example of a, 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 the con we, of a, a place, I'm um, sorry, of a question in the archeology span of the Mississippi Valley that needs to be asked in the way you just put it, that isn't being asked, and yet it's so obvious that there is more to this than, than we've been led to believe. At about 200 BC, in the Mississippi Valley and much of the eastern United States, corn, you know, a Mesoamerican crop, shows up. Uh, at the same time, tobacco, a Mesoamerican crop, shows up. At, shortly thereafter, there are some really significant ritual religious developments in the, in the heart of the country, uh, especially the Ohio Valley, but it's kind of spread out all over. Um, Oddly, archaeologists haven't thought about what food meant and the narratives and the songs and the, the, the cosmological kind of imaginings that came along with corn and tobacco. 
they've only treated it as well, it's, it's a food resource. They it's probably gave them more calories. They could have more babies. You could have bigger populations. That led to this religious and ritual elaboration. And you sit back and you think, oh my God, it's, a, it's this correspondence that probably means that there's a whole lot more going on with corn and tobacco than just a resource, you know, and a food or a, a psychotropic kind of material. Um, there's a connection, a broad historical um, um, happening that they're reaching, you know, that there's a, a global moment of sorts, a globalizing moment in a way, that we haven't theorized or thought about or certainly adequately explained because we haven't t taken that approach where let's look around us today and, and how does this work today? Um, instead, we've kind of relied on these old ideas of you know, origins of population development and growth, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I want to ask about corn. I mean, I, I take it people who study the history of corn regard it as a kind of miracle. I mean, this is something produced by a process of kind of selection and uh, breeding and, and that that's, must have been a tremendous accomplishment. We don't have a clue about exactly how it came about, but we have we know that we know that something this was a, a, an engineering project. <laughs> Well, one simple question is: When it came to Mesoamerica, was it pretty, or came into you know 200 BC? It came into the area you're studying. Was it pretty much finished? I mean, had the the had the had the engineering then already been done, or where was it? Uh, no, it's, it hasn't been done, um, and there are um, diverse opinions on on you know what different strains come in when. Um, I can certainly tell you that it, when it first arrived, it was just a little nubbin of an ear. And, and then mostly it seems to have been turning up in ritual contexts. It, it's, it's, it's not initially a big uh, a, you know, a crop, that, a staple crop that they use to, to supplement or replace other you know, staples. Um, so I think that even adds more credence to what I was just talking about, the, the mythological, sort of symbolic significance of this plant from an exotic land. But, uh, but then, uh, it, it is, it, it's really it's an interesting plant because it, it seems that people kind of know that it's not a great food right away, and so some regions drop it over the next few centuries, others pick it up, it's, it's real um, up and down, sporadic kind of plant human history until AD 800. In AD 800, there's another surge. There's a, maybe it's a new strain or um, a new connection with Mesoamerica. Um, and it's intensified at that point. At that point, it's bigger. And they do you start using it as a staple crop. And that basically funds the rise of Cahokia, the city. Um, you know, uh, that's a gross exaggeration, but there's this you know, historical uh, relationship. Corn at 800, Cahokia at about 1050. Uh, so it's a complicated, you know, a human plant relationship that I can't under that I can't really explain very well, um, and it's an active um, uh, area of investigation by um, biological uh, plant biologists right now. Do you think that? Corn traveled with the idea of selective breeding and hybridization, or the corn arrives and then someplace later on, fooling around with corn arrives. Or how, how does what do you think happens there? Another really good question. Um, I, now, in, in people all around the world, including Mesoamerica and Eastern North America, before corn. We're fooling around with other plants, and also intensifying them in, in, in moments of time, or um, or you know, like you know, deciding ah, that you know we don't like that anymore. So I think there probably was um, a, a, a an early kind of scientific understanding that you can change the, the the qualities and the characteristics of plants. So I wouldn't be surprised. And corn arrives; they understand it is a plant. 
and that you can you know, pick it at a certain time, save certain seeds, plant them in certain kinds of soils or under certain conditions, and you can modify um, the, the, the result. Um, beyond that, I, can't, I don't know that I can answer that very well. I, I certainly see people as uh, inherently creative all around the world, you know, from, from, from going all the way back to 40,000 know, years ago or more with the early Homo sapiens, and I, you know, pretty much just like us. So, yeah, they under, I think they understand basics like that, especially since, I mean, they are really reliant upon such things. Um, they have leaders, they have people who remember, you know, this uh, obscure knowledge that they're going to go back and consult. So even if some of them don't know it, there's somebody around who probably does. Uh, you know, and it, I don't, want to, I don't mean to leave the realm of biology in the past, uh, plant biology in the past, but there's certainly more discussion lately of, huh, looks like not only do we have priests and religious people in the distant Native American past, but we have uh, geometers, um, uh, philosophers of sorts, early kinds of archeologists. Uh, in some ways, I mean, there is a Native American science that was developing. And when you have these fluorescences of, of monumental and religious activity, you can see that they are exploring their worlds and all the dimensions of it just like any human being um, would today or in some other place in the past. So I, I, I you know, I, it, it, sort of, it makes it, turns this kind of debate of like science versus, you know, other native voices and interests on its head because all people, in trying to understand the world around them, approach it in somewhat scientific terms. That is, you have you have an idea. Does that idea hold out? I mean, does it hold up? Because it, what if something else happens? Well, you're going to change that idea and reformulate it and come up with a new one and then try that one out. That's sort of the basics of science. Uh, so I, I I think that's kind of fun, and so that's why yeah, plant biology manipulating plants sure. I think they were doing that. Yeah. I, what, in my travels in southwest Minnesota, I met a young guy, probably hasn't happened, uh, had a lot of education. I don't know what his history was, but he was telling me that when he got, he was seven years old, he had this ambition to grow every vegetable. And he was telling me now at age, 30 or so. Well, I've done about 2,000. And it takes a lot of research to find out how to make some things grow in Minnesota, but there are about 500 that grow pretty well in Minnesota. And now, this guy, I mean, he's somebody you'd expect in the agronomy department of a major university, but he wouldn't be caught dead in the ground. He's just, he's just a truck farmer who has that kind of intellectual energy. Um, and he isn't the only person I met out there with that kind of intellectual energy and that kind of willingness to try anything and push stuff. Yeah. And, and it got me wondering, now, do we have reason to assume very much less mental energy in the place among individuals in the place places like the ones you study. Uh, I mean, lifespans would have been shorter, right? Right. So what would they be? Uh, Forty is old. Forty. People old. lived as old as we live, but you know that not nearly as many. So you don't have as much time. You probably don't have as much energy because you're not getting the calories. Um, Lots of, I would expect lots of leisure someplace in the season. Sure. Uh, it depends when, you know, when we are talking about. If we're talking about, you know, food producers, you know, especially corn agriculture, yeah. You know, in, in the wintertime there will be activities, but you'll have leisure time, maybe a lot of it. Uh, and certain people more than others. Um, you know, earlier in time, it's it's more difficult to say. So you could have you can imagine in certain places, let's say Minnesota, 
hunter-gatherer bands might spend a whole lot of their day foraging and, and then, you know, transporting food and then do the same the next day and the next day. But you can also imagine in other places, in other parts of the world, even in the United States, um, where it's so lush, not that much time is taken up in foraging. Um, and so there's much more leisure time. Um, there's there's a good examples of this in, you know, the earliest place in, in the Americas, one of the earliest places in the world for monumental architecture, turns out is in Louisiana. You know, and it's at a, at a period going all the way back to 3500 BC, it's this extremely lush environment. You know, aquatic resources, forest resources, um, anything you can imagine grows in Louisiana. <laughs> so people lived off the land, you didn't have to go very far to do that, and you had sedentary foragers building ex uh, impressive um, base camps in towns, 3500 BC. Uh, and um, I, so I, I guess, I'm not even sure how to approach this question of leisure, really, because it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, some people would argue, too, that leisure doesn't lead to more activity in terms of creative uh, uh, thoughts and, and practices, that it might lead to less, you know, that necessity is a mother of invention. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about all of that. I do know, however, that um, Louisiana produces these amazing complexes, and those complexes involve people doing extraordinary things, uh, engineering-wise, um, and you know, long-distance uh, 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 travel and other kinds of outreach. Um, I'm drifting away from your question a little bit here. I've, I've actually kind of lost it. Well, I'm just curious about the sort of how much one can reconstruct the peculiarity of of individual creativity or individual lives in this digging in the dirt. I mean, one knows that there's incredible intellectual energy in individuals that sometimes gets lost or sometimes is only locally expressed. Uh, one wants to say, well, if that translates back, there must have been all kinds of things going on, all kinds of strange entrepreneurial scientific religious constructions alongside of the official ones or um, but is that is that a level of detail we just can't get at? I refuse to believe that archaeologists can't get at detail at any point in the past. Now, you know, of course I know from having done a lot of field work that in, in various times, in various places, you, you it's not there. It's destroyed, it's degraded, and so you can't get it there. But there are these remarkable finds still, uh, you know, around the world of, that gives you these amazing details. You know, like a frozen ice man in the Alps, for instance. And all of a sudden, because of this one uh, find, you have this incredible window into the detailed lives of the Neolithic people, you know, in, in Europe. Uh, so I think I'm very much the optimist and the kind of the positive thinker about what we can know. Um, let me give another example that might help fill this out. Now, now, so I was talking about Louisiana and these, you know, mounded sites going back to 3500 BC, and and we used to think, oh, well, okay, they had a lot of leisure time. They built some mounds. Um, that was pretty much the explanation. Uh, just recently, we, uh, an archaeoastronomer friend of mine, went back and finally, because of the aid of modern technology, laser scanning from the sky, was able to get uh, highly detailed maps of these mound complexes and uh, realized that they are engineered with incredible amount of skill. Um, they, there's a, a sort of a um, standardized units of measurements. They are laid out with, with precisely with reference to the, the soul of the year and the rising and setting sun and various times of that year. Um, and they probably were all built in, in fairly, fairly rapidly with the co cooperation of, of a large group of people uh, for some bigger purpose. And so that's another instance of 
whoa, there's more here. And in a way, it gives us a detail um, about um, a broader scale uh, um, phenomenon that we didn't have until this, this friend, uh, Bill Romain, got the LIDAR maps, these laser maps, and, and then did the, uh, the archaeoastronomy, which is, you know, the techniques have been known for years. And now we have this new piece of evidence that's going to change how we think about that period of, of history. So it's, it's spotty. It involves tacking back and forth between big patterns that are kind of vague, and then these details that come up sometimes randomly, and we have to be kind of flexible and be able to kind of adjust our research programs to take advantage of those details when they are there. This is, I think, the second time in our conversation that the idea of ritual complexes being built quite quickly has come up. I'd never heard of that before. You haven't heard of it because people weren't asking the right questions. And when you ask the right questions, informed by a I don't know, it's called social history, like uh, uh, more, um, more information about how people do things in the contemporary world or in the recent past. Um, you ask the right questions, you then look for the corresponding data that, uh, that says yes or no, or kind of allows you to embellish the, the, your answer. And, and when you look, you realize, oh, yes, there actually are, around the world, some of these complexes are built fast. Um, and things that we used to think of as the origins of civilization are kind of a gradual development because these various factors contributing to the rise of, you know, a bigger group of people who are more complex uh, are sort of an impoverished explanation of how these things actually work. Because um, now, we could, you know, we've been able to move beyond that. And so, uh, the newer explanation, and, and it's true of many civilizations in the Americas, are that certain of them arise abruptly because they're parts of religious movements or political religious movements, where there is a prophet or some charismatic people or just an idea or a thing that everybody kind of gloms onto and that snowballs incredibly fast. I'm thinking of the the story of the of the 1892 World's Fair in Chicago, which <laughs> built like the largest enclosed space in the world. Yeah, yeah. It mimicking the largest enclosed space in the world that was built in Britain <laughs> earlier, and you know we have to have a counterpart to the Eiffel Tower, and so the Ferris wheel goes up. I mean, we are familiar with this impulse. And in, in the and everything comes together in 1892 because it's it's 400th anniversary of Columbus. It's the, the you know the full recovery from the Civil War. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> this is how human history works. I mean, not always. I mean, there I mean, there's quite a variety. <laughs> and when we're collapsing it, you know, uh, maybe I'm collapsing it a little bit too much. But yeah, there is something to this. That was a movement of sorts. Maybe it had some you know, business impulse behind it, or, or, but not just that. It also had these, this will, wanting to be cosmopolitan and to be worldly, you know, and so World's Fair. That impulse probably is also somewhat like ancient uh, Louisiana, uh, that's be cosmopolitan. Like, we are the center of the world, so where are the edges? And I can mark the edges and mark the movements of things, you know, across this, through this world. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but it took, it took us to actually think about that in a slightly different way so that we could then go look for the, those kinds of sites and that, that archaeology before we could then tell the story like that. Thank you.